video, a short video. I mean, every work of art has some kind of meaning. It's really a question if we know how to read it or not, if we can hear and learn that meaning. And the Atikara may reside in people who have not been trained in the full world of Sanskrit erudition, let us say, or, or in Telugu or in Tamil, but people who have some kind of sensibility that allows them to hear that. Hello and welcome to this uh, second episode <coughs> in the second series of Chicago Dialogues. <coughs> I am Deepesh Chakravarti and I'm currently uh, the faculty director of the University of Chicago Center in Delhi. And I also teach in the departments of history and South Asian languages and civilizations at the University of Chicago. This series is proposed is, uh, is being produced and presented in collaboration with uh, between the center and uh, Prohor in uh, in it's, it's the Calcutta base outfit, and we are extremely lucky to have uh, writer Abhik Chanda as the anchor of this series. I think a well-known writer, a published poet, an entrepreneur, a uh, really multi-talented person, and we are very lucky to have him. And today's episode is very special uh, uh, in the sense that we are, um, with this one, we start interacting with um, people I would regard as friends of uh, Chicago, the university, but also friends of South Asian studies at the university who are connected to us, uh, sometimes to individual scholars at the University of Chicago, but who are also part of our intellectual life. I mean, even when they're not physically at Chicago, we're discussing them, we're debating with them, we're disagreeing with them, we're agreeing with them, and generations of students grow up uh, studying these people. Sometimes their own students come and, and study with us in Chicago. Sometimes um, our students um, graduate, and then sometimes they come back and go back to work with these people. And one of one, of one such person, is today's guest, David Schulman. And uh, David is probably one of the most remarkable people working on India, Indian traditions, Indology, but not just Indology, not just textual traditions, also on, on traditional performance and connection between text and performance. Um, I don't have to introduce him formally. He, uh, one can't think of certain aspects of South Asian studies or Indian studies without his presence and without thinking of his contribution. But David is also, at least I found him to be a fascinating human being with many, many facets to his life and work. He's also a peace activist. I hope that's a correct description of, of what he does as a citizen of Israel, as somebody who can combine his commitment to Israel with his commitment to social justice and, and fairness, and who can engage, um, you know, the complex histories that we are sometimes faced with 
uh, of history of humanity in particular parts of the world at particular times, the complexity of being human is something that stays in the face. And I think of David as somebody who, who engages uh, with that experience, both uh, in a way that actually contributes to our own sense of being human, what it means to be human. So this could be a conversation in which I hope my esteemed colleagues and dear colleagues, Gary Tubb and Whitney Cox, who are participants, will, uh, this will, will kind of cover all these different aspects of David's life and through the discussion illustrate what it means to be a South Asian scholar from outside of South Asia. From, I mean, all three people who are talking about are not born in South Asia. They come to South Asian studies from very different life trajectories. Um, in, in all of their cases, trajectories that have their beginnings in in America, in the United States, uh, and and these are trajectories through which we come to when we study them, when we think about them, we come to study, we come to understand really what is at stake in scholarship, which is not always visible uh, necessarily. Or when you think of scholars as as just people who write dry texts or specialized texts that only few people have access to. This expression that Harar used to use and others used to use, the life of the mind, is something that I think is embodied in the best moments in the institutional history of the University of Chicago. But it's also something that is um, lived and illustrated by the life and work of somebody like David, something that my colleagues also believe in, something we all believe in collectively. So this is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to explore really what I was describing as what is at stake in studying the region we call India. How does how do how do these how do these studies come back to inform other aspects of our life that are also always there because we are after all human beings, which even before we are scholars. So with that introduction I have a to introduce my colleagues formally. I extend my warmest welcome to David uh, and, and my thanks to him for, for agreeing to take part in this conversation. Um, and thanks to Gary and Whitney for being there to carry on the conversation. And I very much look forward to everything that you have to say. Uh, welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you, DJ. And I think we'll just jump right in. Um, yeah, so, uh, so, uh, so Gary, you wanted to start off our conversation. Uh, yes, let me begin by also thanking David for agreeing to do this. It's always great to have an opportunity to uh, hear David Schulman speak and to do it before uh, an audience that's partly new is, uh, is a very welcome opportunity. Um, uh, David um, uh, has uh, worked uh, in many different places and uh, in many different ways. Uh, his work, I think one theme that runs throughout his approach to all of his activities is an interest in ways of seeing which is appropriate since for a long time David has uh, been working from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, from a campus that's uh, located not only in a city that is viewed by many uh, ritually as the highest point uh, on earth, but more specifically from a campus located on a hill that uh, in its names in many languages uh, Mount Scopas, Har Hatsofim, refer to its status as a lookout point. So I always think of David as looking out on the world, trying to decide where he's going to work next or what he's going to work on. Uh, but it does often involve some aspect of seeing. The book that uh, David Schulman has been working on most recently has to do specifically with inwardly directed seeing. Uh, 
title of the book is and of our event tonight is introspection and uh, inside um, this uh, is uh, shaping up to be a fascinating book partly because uh, the meaning of various ways of referring to the inner part uh, of each of us is, is a very complicated topic um, and so Whitney and I thought that we might start uh, by asking uh, David to give us a little introspection and insight uh, directed to his own uh, inner inner life and starting from the very beginning uh, in uh, a rather small city in uh, 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 Northeast uh, Iowa in the United States, Waterloo, Iowa. And so the first question is, has to do with how it happens that a nice young boy from Waterloo ends up working on uh, uh, South India and uh, other far-flung topics. And also, uh, how does he become someone who, in both his academic work and uh, other areas uh, of his life, um, displays such a, uh, an open-hearted, uh, humanistic approach? After coming from a city that for many people in America anyway, is known mostly for producing people such as the energetically anti-factual politician, Michelle Bachman, or uh, <laughs> uh, another example, Michael Townley, the ruthless assassin in the service of the secret police of Augusto Pinochet. So how does it happen that the same city produces yet another international celebrity of such different interests and such different impacts. So, David, could we persuade you to say a little about your early years in Waterloo and how that could possibly have led to where you have been since then? Uh, I'll try. I don't really know the answer to that question or those questions. Um, and in general, I think uh, human motivation is a mystery also in my own case. But I can say a few things about Iowa that are perhaps relevant to this. Uh, yeah, in fact, in a certain sense, I think I have what um, I sometimes call Iowa syndrome. Um, I should begin by saying that my foundational sense of the world, the way the world looks and smells and the colors and the seasons and all of that, they're very much rooted in Iowa, even now, even though I've spent most of my life in other places. And the, I mean, the childhood envir environment was a wonderful one. But at some point around the age of maybe 13, 14, um, I began to long for landscapes, not just physical landscapes, also mental landscapes that um, were not going to be flat. I was like incredibly flat uh, and not only in the way the, the in the lie of the land. Um, so I, in fact, I'm not alone in this. Um, even in South Asian studies, uh, Richard LaRiviere is also an Iowan and he agreed with me when we discussed Iowa syndrome. There is something impelling young Iowans to maybe look for places that have uh, you know, spicy food and uh, racy music and powerful poetry and all kinds of other things. I guess that was true in my case. Um, I have a theory about this, actually. Um, you know, Iowa, there was a certain um, vibrancy, although it was a very uh, kind of remote and um, small and rather exotic place. I think more exotic than most of the places that I've been in, living in. Um, it, Iowa has always been known and is still known for the high quality of its educational um, apparatus and uh, schools. And that was also true. Um, it was true for me. And uh, cultural events uh, tended to produce a tremendous um, enthusiasm in the city. Uh, you know, if an opera company, wandering, traveling opera company came by to perform La Boheme, the whole city would turn out to watch it. So I refer to this um, 
uh, as the compensatory intensity of the periphery. It's not unique to Iowa by any means, but it seems to be true, or it was true, I think, for me. There are other places in the world where I've experienced the same kind of thing. But uh, there's another thing I guess I, I might be able to say is that I became intrigued very early on, even as a really young child, I think, four, five, six years old, I was intrigued by the fact that uh, knowing another language opened another world. I grew up in a house that was not exactly bilingual, but there was a lot of Yiddish in it. My grandmother, uh, she was widowed at a young age and she came to live with us and her language was Yiddish, uh, which she spoke with my mother. My mother was born in Iowa, like my father, but um, uh, she, my mother was a fluent Yiddish speaker. And so I heard a lot of Yiddish without ever actually being able to fully uh, master it or anything like that. But it was kind of there in my mind, I think. And I knew I could feel that once someone made the transition from English, Iowa English, to this uh, Ukrainian Yiddish, um, I was in a different um, kind of mental, spiritual, affective space. And I've spent much of my life, really all of my life, um, pursuing that that kind of uh, experience of entering another world through the through the language. Um, so that too belongs to Iowa somehow. My early childhood. There's a there's a way to tie this together with another one of the great uh, Shulman theories that I've carried around with me, which is, um, <coughs> and I wonder if you can relate these two, David, about the theory that to actually to understand a poet, you need to be in the place where the poet lived and wrote. Um, and you and I, I mean, one time I, I remember some years ago after David had paid a visit to the University of Chicago, he convinced me that I should, of course, get on an airplane and go to Cattle to go watch a Kudiatum performance for three days between Christmas and New Year's. And it seemed like the most reasonable thing in the world when David was explaining it to me. Um, but so, I mean, so you can, but so I so projecting it back into Iowa for a second and you as a uh, smart, sensitive, intellectually curious, um, you know, young man living in a, you know, but living in the flattest place on earth. How is it that, I mean, so I guess it brings us to Israel first. I mean, the, the sort of the, the moving, moving to Israel for university, moving into Persian and Arabic and Hebrew, which, um, and how was that? So that was your first experience, I guess, of that, of the saturation of place while, um, and its connection with, you know, with, with language and with, and with understanding. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, I mean, you're right that I think it's really critical to uh, live in the landscapes uh, where and among people who speak the language that you're trying to learn. My students call this the Shulman principle. I um, usually the example that I give, I used to teach a course in um, great books and we would usually begin with the Plato's Symposium. And I would tell them at the very beginning that if they want to understand the symposium, the, the symposium, there are two ways to do it. There's the short path and the long path. So the long path is to go to the library and read all the books about the symposium. There's a whole library about that work. Read them and the you know and the, and the study them and read whatever available translations are there. And then maybe eventually you might actually attain some understanding of the symposium. But the short way is to learn Greek, to learn Greek well, ancient Greek, to read it in Greek, of course, goes without saying, but the Shulman principle says that you have to read it in Greek, in Greece, <laughs> and, uh, you know, in that kind of light and with the food and the music and the smell of the sea and all of those kinds of things. And then there's a chance, I think, at least a good chance that um, you might understand the symposium in a deeper way. So, yeah, I, um, I went to Israel mostly because I'd fallen in love with the Hebrew language. Again, it happened um, around the age of 12, 13. Actually, uh, my parents took my brother and me to visit Israel when um, I was bar mitzvah, that is 13, it was 1962. That was a very unusual thing um, in the early 1960s um, in Iowa. Uh, generally speaking, in those days, Iowans did not across the black waters of the ocean, except um, during the Second World War. My father was overseas uh, in Europe during the war. 
that was something else. But to actually get on a plane and go visit a place that was that far away was kind of unusual. But my mother, uh, who was a kind of visionary person, she wanted to see what Israel was like. I mean, she had grown up with this kind of very Jewish environment. And she was um, like, like Zionist, I guess you could say, in the way that people were in those days. Um, and so she insisted, and so they took us to Israel. And I was just completely overwhelmed by the sensual richness and vibrancy of the place, this Mediterranean world. Uh, again, the light and the smells and the human warmth, tremendous uh, camaraderie and the uh, whole dramatic uh, kind of adventure of it and also the sound of the language. And so I decided that I had to learn Hebrew. Um, but there was really nobody in Iowa who could teach me Hebrew. I mean, the rabbi in the community knew a little, I mean, he knew Hebrew, he could read the text and so on, but there was nobody who could teach me in a kind of full way. So I developed a kind of method of um, some kind of autodidactic uh, study, and I, it was my adolescent passion. Sometimes I think I wasted my adolescence on that when I could have been doing other things, but uh, I was completely ravished by the Hebrew language, which I mean, it's one of the world's great languages and it's very old, it's easily 3,000 years, years old with accumulation of all these layers and a huge literary corpus and all of that. And I immersed myself in it. And um, so I wanted to go live Again, the Shulman principle, I wanted to live in a place where this language, this beautiful language was uh, spoken naturally as a living tongue. And in a way, that's um, that may still be the strongest link that I have to Israel. I mean, I've lived most of my life here. I've been here for 54 years. So my family, my children, my grandchildren, many friends and the Hebrew University, which has um, always been a kind of frame of reference for me and the place that I most identify with. But even now, I think the uh, the joy of uh, speaking Hebrew, teaching in Hebrew, and uh, everything that goes along with that is still very much alive in me. Um, and then that experience began to repeat itself with other languages. Uh, first, as you said, with Persian, which was in a way the great love of my um, early years in Israel. And I went to Iran. Um, I was like drunk on Persian poetry and Arabic to some extent. And from there, I kind of, as you know, drifted east into India, uh, driven by unconscious motivations for the most part. <laughs> I'd like to follow up, David, on your references to uh, uh, aromas and foods and languages and all of the other uh, forms of potential introspection and insight that are not simply visual. Um, and specifically uh, with reference to South India. I mean, we could talk about many things here. We could talk about, I mean, languages, obviously, because beyond Arabic and Persian, you've written so much on Telugu and Tamil and Sanskrit and other languages uh, used in South India. We could also talk about your skill uh, at cooking sambar and other South Indian uh, <laughs> foods. But I wanted to ask um, about another area in which you have also displayed some considerable skill in, in public places, which is Carnatic music. Uh, I've heard you sing and was glad to have heard it. But I bring it up because uh, in the book, on uh, introspection and insight. It's actually, I believe, Carnatic music that you put forward as being perhaps the most representative or useful uh, way of looking at, at introspection in South India. Could you, could you uh, say a little to explain why you make that choice? Yeah. Um, in terms of introspection, I would be prepared to argue, argue in the book that uh, among the uh, various um, very ample, rich, um, introspective materials that we have in the early modern period in South India. Perhaps the domain par excellence of introspection is in Carnatic music. Uh, Carnatic music is not only the musical text, the musical texts invariably come with a verbal text, you know. Um, Carnatic music, uh, unlike Hindustani music, Carnatic music is a music of compositions like Western classical music. And the verbal part of it is essential. 
And if you uh, try to understand the linkage between, let's call it the musical score or the performance score and the, um, the verbal text, then um, you begin to see the um, very subtle and often very powerful um, introspective um, statements that are made on both of those levels. So yeah, the book has, um, there are two or three uh, Carnatic uh, Kritis, Kirtanas, that I bring as examples of this kind of what I'm calling introspection. And in general, I have to say that uh, Carnatic music, I mean, from the moment I was first exposed to it, was really a tremendous um, discovery for me. My teacher, John Marr, my guru, uh, he got into South Indian languages and literatures through the music. He was primarily a musician and musicologist um, and uh, a great connoisseur of, uh, of um, Carnatic music. Uh, he began to study Tamil mostly because he came to Soas right after he was demobbed uh, after the war. He'd spent the war years in Bangalore and the RAF. As soon as he was demobbed, he, he got back to England, came to Soas uh, because he wanted to study Telugu, which is the premier language of South Indian music, a very logical choice. Uh, but the only the person who was teaching uh, Telugu in Soas was a man called Thompson. He was a direct uh, student of the great Uve Saminath Iyer, the founder of modern Tamil studies. Um, and uh, he was obsessed with Tamil. He knew Telugu, but he was obsessed with Tamil. And he, um, I think, uh, persuaded Mar or steered him gradually into doing Tamil, which became his uh, great area of ex expertise or one of them. So I, I suppose I, I imbibed some of that passion from Mar himself, along with the fact that he had an unabashed love for everything South Indian and particularly Tamil. And in that respect, he was a little different than many of the other um, people in the uh, India department at SOAS who um, treated their areas of studies as areas of expertise and intellectual interest. But Mar had a very profound personal um, uh, love for the world that he was studying. And uh, that too was a great discovery for me that one could actually study something in a university, even do a higher degree in something that had some kind of personal meaning, you know, and was not merely a kind of intellectual pastime. The music was a big element in that. Also, I, I should say that uh, my wife, Eileen, learned to sing Carnatic music when we were living in what was then Madras, and I it was in 1975-76, and uh, she found a teacher. She was, she comes, Eileen, from a very musical family. She's very musical herself. And she found a teacher who lived just down the street from us. And she uh, she studied with her, even though they shared no common language except the music. Um, Ramu, S.P. Ramu, she was a uh, Tamilian, good singer. And uh, Eileen sat at her feet and went through the traditional exercises that usually take something like five or six years for students of Carnatic music in Madras. Eileen ran through all of these exercises in about five or six weeks. And uh, she was then performing with her teacher in temples and singing kirtanas and so on. And uh, so that that was wonderful for me. And uh, in fact, one of the peak experiences of my life is listening to Eileen sing Carnatic music. You know. I could very self-indulgently, I could pick up the thread of any of a number of the points you just made. I mean, about, about Chennai, or about SOAS, a place that David and I share outside of the University of Chicago. And, uh, but I want to, um, pick, following up on what Gary said, I want to come back to the, I want to invite you to talk a little bit about the book. Um, Gary and I had to, have had the treat of being able to look at some of the early parts of it. Um, and I guess you're really, I mean, you make, a, you make a very clear distinction between the um, different kinds or modes maybe of introspection and the specific one that you want to trace. I mean, on the one hand, there is the um, sort of speculative psychological mode of something like Advaita Vedanta, the, the idea of um, uh, the Vaswai Prakashata of the, of the self, the idea that the self is self-illuminating. Is self 
Um, there is the philosophical, I mean, the strictly speaking, sort of formally philosophical idea, like about, say, swasambhiti, uh, self-awareness. Mm -hmm. um, these are these are different. I mean, you're, like I say, you're very clear uh, about the fact that what you're tracing in the early modern period in the South is um, maybe o overlapping in some ways, but really distinct. So could you could you expand a little bit about that? Yeah, um, happily. Um, yeah, I'll say just a few more words about the distinction. Um, I this was a kind of discovery, an empirical discovery that inductively um, we arrived at together in the European Research Council um, group that we have now in Jerusalem, which both of you know very well, which we call NEEM, the New Ecology of Expressive Modes in Early Modern South India. So that we have a core group of um, mostly young scholars, uh, doctoral students and postdocs, some from Chicago, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we've been reading. We have these reading groups. Uh, initially, face to face, of course, the last two years of Corona, these groups have all been on Zoom, but actually, we're reading every day, reading really wonderful texts in all of the South Indian languages and in Sanskrit, and now also in Persian because Zoe Hai is with us and um, Dakni and so on. And uh, it, it began to dawn upon us uh, as a collective research group that these materials were filled with a kind of introspection that was unusual um, within the long continuum of Indian uh, South Asian introspective modes. Um, and very much along the lines that you just said, Wendy, that, uh, Wendy, that is that, um, you know, we have what I sometimes call uh, metaphysical introspection. South Asia has a very, um, uh, well-known and uh, tremendously insightful literature about um, what you could call alternate states of consciousness or deep meditative states, or um, yes, the knowledge of the true self, which is not the empirical self, that is some inner divine part of ourselves. It's there in yoga, it's there in Advaita, uh, it's there uh, in Buddhism, both in the Theravana and the Mahayana traditions. All of that is well known. In Tibet, I think the Tibetans perhaps went farther than any other human civilization in exploring those kinds of um, states of consciousness, you know. But, but the kind of introspection that we began to see in the various sources in Tamil and Telugu and Malayalam and Sanskrit, um, from this early modern period, beginning around the late 15th and 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. This is a kind of lauki, this worldly introspection. This is a way of looking uh, into the self um, in the mode of a diary writer or even an autobiographer. Um, Whitney heard a lecture I gave just this week about a Malayalam uh, autobiography from the 18th century, a very unusual text. It's deeply introspective. So this is a, I think it's would be best defined as a particular mode of paying attention. And it's a particular kind of attention, uh, not to these uh, intima intimations of um, divinity that we may all have within ourselves, but to the everyday flux of consciousness, the stuff of our usual mental life. That is to say, our uh, evanescent feelings, our moods, our uh, dreams, our fantasies, our memories, our projections, all these kinds of things that make up actually the experience of living in a body in the um, empirical world. That's a little new. It's not completely absent by any means from earlier South Indian sources. We can talk about the Bhakti traditions that have something like that maybe. Um, and, and also in Sanskrit, we can find poems that are introspective along those lines. Of course, I, I suppose all human cultures have that. But there's suddenly a kind of uh, efflorescence of these um, laukika, this worldly, uh, uh, empirical uh, attention, uh, modes of, uh, of uh, looking into oneself, which are all about the kinds of things that one would find, for example, in the French diarists of the 18th century, like Saint-Simon, or in the early audio autobiographies that we know, or um, in, I don't know, Montaigne's essay or in Pascal's Pensée. So we don't have, as far as I know so far, we haven't discovered a South Indian uh, Montaigne. My friend Abhilash Malayil, uh, we're working together on this autobiography in Malayalam. 
he promises me that we will find the South Indian montane. Perhaps he's right. I hope so. But what we do have are, are discrete uh, genres that are introspective in the sense that I was describing. So it includes the musical materials that I was mentioning, but also the padam, the dance, drama, musical um, short compositions, which are entirely introspective in this new mode. And it's there in the autobiographical materials, and we have this autobiography, and we also have biographies, which sometimes are like that. And we have a theorization of this kind of introspective mode based on highly personal subjective experience in the amazing text by Dharmaraja. Um, both of you know this text, the Vedanta Paripasha from uh, late 17th century, the Calvary district. He, um, he theorizes this kind of perception just in a way as one might expect would happen in a world in which uh, these introspective um, experiences were suddenly being recorded um, everywhere, you know, and in all the languages. So, I'd like to, if I may, I'd like to ask a, a little more about that uh, in in connection specifically with a uh, couple areas that are somewhat outside your book, namely earlier literature and specifically in Sanskrit, not necessarily from South India. You mentioned that in uh, from the point of view of things such as Advaita Vedanta, the everyday empirical self is different from the real self. Mm. Uh, what I'm wondering about is the fact that beyond the question of what sorts of things you might look at in terms of the empirical self, there's also the question of what sorts of things that you could potentially see there you might think are worth talking about to other people, which is important for your work because your sources are mostly textual sources. Mm. And there, I think, the textual sources have more to say to you than they do to most Sanskritists because your work has always been marked by a real sensitivity to what some people have referred to as reading between the lines. But I think it's more accurate to say that you read more, you see more in the lines than a lot of people do. and so. You know, you very frequently write about uh, uh, metapoetic statements and, and the like. And this interests me partly because, as you know, my own Sanskrit teacher, uh, Daniel Ingalls, wrote a lot about what he called the impersonality of mm. Sanskrit literature and the lack of something that we would recognize as straightforwardly autobiographical. Mm -hmm. And he explained that partly because uh, uh, their interests were more in things that had to do with a different view of the individual uh, in connection with uh, yeah. uh, class membership and so forth. So I just wanted to ask what your current feelings are on this in connection with Sanskrit literature. And I know there would be very different answers if you were talking about, say, Tamil, but to what extent are people engaging in a sort of self-censorship that they're aware of things inside themselves that they don't think it's their business to write about? <laughs> To yeah. what extent do you think that they are in fact writing about it and that uh, many, many scholars have simply not noticed the yeah. full range of what's going on? So we're dealing with kind of vast generalizations. It's a little um, difficult to know where to begin. Um, I, I have to say I've never been fully convinced by this notion of an impersonality built into the structure of say Sanskrit literature or any of the South Asian literature, I don't really believe in it. And I, and I certainly think that um, it's uh, that the uh, discovery of the individual subject, let's call it that, the empirical subjects, not something that begins in the late 15th century. It's not like that. There were, those subjects were there all along. We know that. Um, but um, there is a question about the, um, well, there are two things. First of all, there's a question about the nature of attention, what you're going to pay attention to. Anyway, one of the great themes in any hum human civilization, certainly in India, um, attention, attentiveness, Gary, we've talked about the, the, the Atma Gunas and the Nyaya, Adara, attentiveness is built into the mind. But there are different kinds of attentiveness and paying attention to these kind of uh, very uh, rapidly shifting moods and emotions uh, as a topic in its own right as something worthy of, of um, recording and then enacting perhaps 
whether it's in music or in theater or in the recitation of a literary text, I think that is something which you could say takes off hypertrophies in the uh, in this early modern period. That's one thing. But the other thing is that we're talking about what you could say. Um, I sometimes like to talk about different models of the mind. Um, mm -hmm. There have got to be many models of the mind in South Asia over the centuries. There's a very nice uh, little book by A.A. A. Long. He's a very good classicist expert in Stoicism, in which he writes about models of mind and self in ancient Greece. It's a beautiful book. It had a, I served me as a kind of model in a way, and I, I model in the other sense. And um, I think we can say, I think it's possible to argue um, that in this early modern period, uh, certainly in all of the cultures in the South, it's also probably true in North India too, we begin to see the formation or the crystallization or the articulation of models of the mind that are a little different. So I can give you an example or two because that's a kind of very general way of saying it. Um, you know, I wrote this book about imagination. That's an element in it because I tried to argue there that there's a new theory of the imagination as a very central uh, feature of the human mind and the internal perspective of the South Indian traditions, differently inflected in different works in different periods, but nonetheless, that that's a very major thing. In some ways, a defining feature of a mind, let's say a human mind. So beyond the imagination alone, there's also a set of other very interesting elements or processes or features that um, are uh, extremely prominent in the sources. It's not as if even if we find the South Indian Montaigne, it's going to, he's going to sound like the French <laughs> philosopher. He won't. It'll be rather different. So among other things, what I see um, in the sources that we've been reading together, um, I see a notion of the um, creative aspect of the mind, this self-creation of mind by paying attention to these uh, various other things that I was talking about. That creative ability of the mind which uh, comes along with the whole theory of individual perception, that's, I think, something a little fresh and new in the South Indian landscape. Another element is um, what I sometimes call extrospection. We have introspection, but I think you cannot get introspection without some theory or practice of seeing into other people's minds, which is something that we all do. Actually, we know it. I'm putting aside the question of you know whether other people's minds exist at all and the question of solipsism i heard a marvelous lecture about that by isabel ratier just this week that's a deep philosophical question in the indian schools how is it that we you know do other minds exist and if so how can we understand them? so there are different answers to this question but again in those south indian sources you can see that they think that extrospection is um, a different kind of knowing. It's a, it, it's a form of knowledge which is available probably to everybody. You don't have to be some Mahayogi who can see into other people's minds. Actually, all of us are able to do this to some extent. It's uh, not necessarily uh, immune to error. We can be mistaken when we see into other people's minds, but often it's very true, very much on the mark. And they explore this notion of the how should I call it, the introspective extrospection um, that is built into human interaction as a whole. That's a feature of this South Indian introspective world, you know, and it depends upon some sense of the shared, you know, common universe of um, realistic objects uh, and their organization and their central uh, accessibility and all of those kinds of things. So that idea that even if we, so the, leaving aside the question of the other minds exist, that nevertheless, that other, you know, that there are others that we can reach out to and, um, you know, and connect with in our minds. I mean, obviously this is at the heart of this kind of empathetic um, understanding is at the heart, I think, of all the, of your scholarship and always has been. Um, I'd also like to take that as a chance to using this idea of attention and staying with it for a second to pivot to you know another public more public part of your life. Well, your scholarships, of course, you're a public scholar as well. But this idea about paying attention and um, 
how you know I'm, I was reminded uh, that I'm reminded of a quote from Orwell about you know the hardest things to see are the things right in front of your nose. Um, and I yeah. just I guess I'd like to give that as an opportunity to ask about um, your work for peace and the degree to which this was is I mean can can, can this be linked you think with an idea of yeah I mean both the, your idea of extrospection but also the idea of, of bringing things to awareness bringing things to consciousness in a way where maybe there are things in our you know things in our, mm -hmm. our routines of everyday life that precisely direct us away from that um, and what that kind mm -hmm. of act of um, that kind of paying attention what that what that means and what that can do it's a very fine question Whitney I I um... I think I can say, following your your line of thought, uh, that um, although I'm, for decades I've been involved in the peace movement here, and I used to go to demonstrations and so on a lot, and I worked in East Jerusalem with Palestinians at various points, but the truth is that I um, had very little understanding of what a Palestinian life was really like under the Israeli occupation like most Israelis, you know, Palestinians are kind of, um, I mean, they're everywhere, but they're also kind of invisible. And like almost all my colleagues, uh, you know, I lived under the delusion that um, somehow life under the occupation was viable because the police were there and the soldiers were there and they were supposed to look after the indigenous population just like any other population, including the Israeli settlers. And that was wrong. That was a completely false perception. It was only you know, during the early years of the Oslo period when it, when suddenly there was a breakthrough in the Palestinian uh, world, the occupation became accessible to us. And there were dialogue groups that um, kind of grew up overnight. I was part of one of those groups with a village called Beit Sakhur. And that was the first time that I actually, um, you know, if, experienced what life was like inside the Israeli occupation. And I can tell you back then, this was 1988, 89, it was pretty terrible. And it's now a hundred times more terrible. I hadn't realized that this was meant, you know, being in a Palestinian house, eating with them, sometimes sleeping overnight, sometimes breaking through the police or army barricades in order to get to these Palestinian friends, you know, it really changed my life so that when the second intifada broke out in the autumn of the year 2000. Um, we understood, I mean, it wasn't me alone, that we understood that we had a task to perform, that we had to be present physically on the ground um, in the occupied territories in order to protect the civilian Palestinian population, because if we weren't there, nobody else was going to do it. And that is a kind of attentiveness. It is a way of, I mean, you can call it empathy, you can wonder about the sources of empathy. It's an interesting question. Um, but I think any, I would say actually that any normal, reasonably humane person, um, they were to come with us into the Palestinian territories on any day and just uh, do what we do, accompanying these farmers or shepherds to their fields, protecting them, fighting off the settlers and the police with our bodies. Anybody who would see it would be horrified. It's a truly horrific reality. And so that has become a central part of my life. You know, It's David, not I, connected. Yeah. Sorry, I mean, this is interesting. This has been so interesting that I actually requested to be brought up onto the screen <laughs> so I could join the discussion. <laughs> yeah. But, but following up on Vipi's question and going back to what you were saying at the very beginning, when you're discussing the two ways of studying the symposium, Mm. And one was the, the scholarly way of going to the library and reading commentaries and learning languages, but you know, coming up with something which is what we normally do in SALC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gary and I, we all engage in that kind of exercise. And then this other way, which also learned, included learning language, but also included going to the place, even after hundreds of years have gone by. Yeah. Going to the place and trying to receive something of the experience of having been there or the experience you know like it's partly ethnography it's partly in the way that ethnographers ideally would want to get inside the skin or historians would ideally ask what was it like to live in those times um, 
but when we ask what was it like, so what I want to bring in is the question of an understanding that is not part of one's embodied experience and an understanding that is actually a part of one's embodied experience of, of something, right? And, and here is the hub of the question. So in and in Western knowledge systems, we have both. I mean, we have Rankian history or anthropology carrying that ethnographic instinct, but we also have a Kantian tradition of wanting to be disinterested, wanting to be disembodied, and thinking that somehow it's only yeah. in imagine disembodied state that I can get to the truth yeah. of something. Now, what I was going to ask you was that um, I often think that the wanting to be disembodied and, and, and kind of separating knowledge from one's experience of being in the world has also been part of the scientific revolution, so-called, mm. and, and part of the expansion of Europe, the, the fact of empires mm -hmm. and, and, and colony making for all the good and bad things that it's done. Mm -hmm. So two questions. One is that, do you think your the second mode of understanding that you were talking about lends itself more easily to a non-imperial way of approaching plurality in the world? And is that connected to your desire to actually experience how it how the Palestinians lived yeah. to spend nights with them before getting to getting into the peace activism. So, so there are two aspects to the question. One is to ask you, invite you to say a little bit more about how you see that these two modes of understanding, which are with us in the university, in yeah. different in the making ways, and then whether you do see your preference for the second mode of that is learning the language, going to the place, making your knowledge part of your embodied experience as part of, as a central part of your activism. Yeah. So, um, I'll, say, uh, I'll say something a little provocative, um, directly linked to your question. Um, you know that uh, Kant, uh, uh, who also writes about introspective, obviously right, a deeply introspective person, but he also says that the inner self, which is an important element in Kant, uh, knowledge of the inner self gained by paying attention to what's happening in your inner self actually uh, tells you nothing about the self, he says, you know, <laughs> and uh, it can even drive you mad, he says, if you pay too much attention to this. So I, here's the prov provocative uh, thought. I think that that kind of a notion may not exist in South Asia, in the yeah. historical South Asian traditions. That is that level of radical dichotomization of body and mind, I don't know. I mean, we could talk about it, but I tend to feel that it's not an accurate um, description of the South Asian intellectual traditions as a whole, and yes. certainly not in these early modern uh, texts in the last four or five hundred years. You know, And then the sort of ethical um, implication of the question that you're asking, I think it, whether, <laughs> I don't know if the other kind of introspective knowledge is going to actually heal the colonial instinct maybe not but i can say from personal experience you know that uh, you know i mean a week ago i was with these palestinian shepherds and the bedouins actually in the jordan valley it's um it's a tremendous thing for me i mean it's painful because they're suffering on the other hand to know that suffering first of all by speaking, you know, I'm, we're interacting in Arabic. That's another thing. So I'm seeing the world in that in that linguistic realm, which has its own rich uh, associations and sensual perceptions, and like any other language. And I'm seeing it largely under the aspect of pain. Although not on, not only my good friend Abu Ismail, he's become a very close friend. Uh, Yigal Broner was with me on the last Friday when I was there. He said that the Abu Ismail is a joyful man. He's a kind of Bedouin Zorba, he said. And that's true. That element is also there. That is, there's an element of friendship which is kind of um, nourished by sharing that world and sharing the suffering. And that, whatever one wants to call it, that experience of empathy or compassion or whatever it might be and friendship that's become a fundamental 
part of my life, um, really central theme in my life. Yeah. No, I, I was just uh, fascinated by the distinction. I've always, even within myself, you see, I mean, because I grew up Bengali, and I study a lot of me, a lot of my work is to do Bengal, and I'm always, yeah. I'm always caught up between. Uh, you know, I mean, in an experience that is not unique to me, I think Evan Srinivas hmm. learning to be an anthropologist right. for human people. So a lot of our our engagement with modern knowledge in in South Asia for generations, for a few generations now, yes. has mostly been about being caught up in this cleft, in, in, in this kind of cleavage, and and you know mm. between yeah. between these two, both have, wanting to objectify ourselves. Yes, in a, in a way that is central to Western knowledge making, yeah. as well as having grown up with an embodied experience of smell, food, <laughs> you know, taste, yeah. right. music, yeah. sports. I mean, uh, and something I realized that when I became a PhD student in Australia, I said, you know, um, what I learned to do is to separate in some way. It never got completely separated. My object of study mm. uh, from things it. It was immediately connected in the philosophical sense of immediate. Nothing mediated it, right? So, yeah, yeah. so right. Our, our political propositions were not separate from which soccer clubs we supported, you know, and why we supported them. And then actually, but obviously, so it was fascinating to hear you making that that journey. Yeah. Some, some of my friends say that I'm a closet Advaitin, which actually is probably true. Right. And I think that in the classical Advaita, the ultimate mistake is in objectifying oneself, turning the self into an object, I which think is something we can hardly avoid, actually. You know? Right. I, I think um, African people in the, in the in the green room as well are now wanting to open up uh, the conversation for questions. But before yeah. that, I should I should close it with that like, for not introducing Larry and Whitney formally. Uh, and, it, it, and I should do so now before we open it up. And Gary and Whitney are very well-known scholars of Sanskrit, and Whitney also does Tamil. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Gary came from Chicago from Harvard, and, and Whitney, of course, is a Chicago uh, PhD student who uh, then taught in SOAS, and we're very lucky to have him back. Uh, and one reason I thought would be interesting is actually to bring three Indologists together <laughs> to talk about the the experience, the formative experience that have made you what you are, but it's fascinating. So, uh, yeah, I'll shut up now, but I just couldn't resist well, thank you. asking you the question. So, Dipesh, can we turn to questions from uh, from other people? Or? Yeah, I think um, I think there's one on the screen, if you can. Yeah. Shall we read it? Uh, Sure. Do you want to read it aloud? For, or, uh, yeah, I could read it. So this is from Arnab Basu who asked, when the Northern Indian worship Rama, sometimes it becomes racist towards the Dravidian people. What is the modern imagery, what is the Southern imagery of Lord Rama-like? Mm. So it's the, uh, yeah. I actually have to say, I don't believe there is such a thing as a Dravidian people. Yeah. And uh, Dravidian for me is purely a linguistic term. And I don't like it when it's used in a kind of uh, ethnographic or, uh, I don't know, uh, political sense above all. There's a kind of political mythology that goes like that. So actually, I, I don't really think that uh, it makes sense to talk about the South Indian Dravidian speakers as uh, you know some other race or something like that. Don't think so. In general, the in general the division between Sanskrit and the South Indian languages, I think, is a very artificial one. But one thing I might mention is that uh, the early Bengali sort of anglicized poet Michael Madhusudan Dutta of the yeah. 19th century, whose whose uh, epic or epical kavya we call it Mahakavya, Meghnadva. Uh, yeah, it was translated by our, our colleague Clint Seely. Our, you know, uh, he obviously he was in love with the Ravana of the Southern Recensions. So yeah. He thought Rama was a weak kind of character that he couldn't like at all uh, as a yeah. hero, and he thought Ravana was much more like a hero. And yeah. then he upset many Bengalis by making Ravana 
the main hero of his of his story. Ravana in the Kambaramayana, the Tamil Ramayana, uh, people always say that uh, the poet preferred Ravana to his ostensible hero, Rama. Uh, shall we move on to another yeah. question? Um, this is Aritra's Dome asking in all your experience with Carnatic music and Tamil literature, have you found a reflection of the caste system there? Despite the incredible richness of these, one would probably find a lot of casteist values in them. How should one reconcile this? Probably casteist values are um, a considerable range of ideas. Um, there is the reality of uh, caste society, which is certainly part of the classical and the medieval literature, early modern literature, no question. Um, so there's no, uh, there's no point in trying to pretend that doesn't exist. I can say that in the early modern period in the South, uh, there's a interest in um, non-ascriptive uh, political actors and economic actors in which the caste um, Identity is um, actually of no relevance uh, whatsoever. It's a new, it's a feature, actually a, a diagnostic feature of the period. We've written quite a lot about that. Yeah. Although vis-a-vis -vis Carnatic music, this might be a chance to mention a little bit about your friend T.M. Krishna. I mean, who- Yeah, yeah. So much. yeah. that's he's, true. Yeah. He's uh, doing whatever he can, and that's quite a lot to uh, extend the range of the Carnatic uh, music and connoisseurship to everybody, to take it out of the kind of stranglehold of the, um, I don't know, upper caste dominated uh, music academy in Madras and uh, make it a much more available and accessible experience. So he sings on buses, public buses, and he sings on the beach and uh, you know, all of them. That's wonderful. Did you have yeah. I think there's another question from uh, coming up uh, from Tanmay Bhattacharya. So I'll read out. You have described this Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a battle between sons of darkness. What are your thoughts about the idea of power that shapes conflict as a whole? Do you think that power is a key catalyst that has shaped our history and culture throughout time? So your thoughts on power. So I'd like to answer this question by referring to one of the classical medieval uh, Hebrew philosophical texts. It's called the Kuzari by Yehuda Halevi. He was a poet and a philosopher. And um, in this book, uh, there is a um, kind of a debate between a Jewish rabbi and uh, other people at the court of the Khazars in uh, you know, the Caucasus, Central Asia. Um, and uh, these are the days when the Jews, you know, we we're talking about a thousand years ago, the Jews had no power whatsoever. They were completely powerless in terms of political, um, the political realm, and they were very vulnerable. And uh, so the rabbi, uh, this question actually came to the rabbi, what about power, you know, and how is it, is it, you know, uh, are the Jews actually um, uh, privileged not to have to uh, dirty their hands with power because, you know, uh, look at the values we're able to espouse. And the rabbi very wisely says, and this is the voice of the author, he says, it's true the Jews are powerless now, but if they ever get power, they'll be just like everybody else. And I'm afraid that that has proven to be true in Israel. I think this, we have one more um, question perhaps um, coming up, and maybe we'll make that the last question before we have concluding remarks. And it's a question coming up from somebody. Um, Okay, so Samadhi Goswami asks, your book, Dark Hope, details the conflict vividly. Can you perhaps tell us some of your personal experiences where you have seen Israeli citizens are standing in solidarity with Palestinians? Do you see a broader unity being forged across communities despite the toxic hate being spread by many influential people? So, you know, I don't have time to tell you um, very many personal experiences. Um, I can say that I've seen 
I've seen very moving, uh, moving things uh, with my fellow activists. I've seen very ordinary people. They're not extraordinary. They're ordinary people who are unable to bear the uh, responsibility for the crimes that the government is uh, inflicting and the army and so on is inflicting upon innocent civilians. And so they are prepared to take the risks involved, which are sometimes very real risks, um, just out of the basic humane instinct that a good person might have. I've seen very ordinary people, that includes me, very ordinary person, very ordinary people that I've seen, I've seen them doing extraordinary things. And that is there. And what will happen eventually, nobody can say, but I tend to believe that the relations that we've forged with um, our Palestinian friends, um, you know, they have a perhaps some kind of effect in the world. It's, you don't know what the effect of your deeds are going to be ever. But I see children watching us, um, you know, tearing down a roadblock with our bare hands together with our Palestinian friends. That's something that offers some slim kind of hope. But I think with, uh, with that hopeful statement, however slim, it's very strong. Uh, I want to ask my colleagues if they have any final questions to ask of David before I thank you all. Uh, no, as, although as always, I look forward to continuing the conversation again sometime soon. Yeah, me too. And, and Gary? No, I'd just like to thank you, Dipesh, for, uh, for your contributions to this and to, uh, to say how uh, enjoyable it is to bring together uh, people who have been colleagues at the University of Chicago and are sometimes far flung in the world. Uh, so thanks for arranging this, uh, Dipesh and, and David, thanks for agreeing to do it. Thanks Thank to you. all three of you. It's been a real pleasure, as always. And thank you from my part to all three of you for being on this program, and especially to David for agreeing to be on this program. I think I just hope and I, I feel confident that your conversation will have made visible to people why it's meaningful to study. Oh, <laughs> it's a lovely thought. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank I you hope so. very much. So, well, Spain, you all have good days, evenings, wherever, whatever you're facing, and take care in this. Thank this you, time. everybody. Thank Bye. You Bye, Whitney. Bye, Bye Gary. Bye. And, and I thank the whole team. Sorry, you're off. You're, no, I just want to thank, um, you know, Anitesh's team, Akash and Shonot, and, and of course, Ohik, who are actually, who are all the help they've been giving us throughout these difficult years to make such conversations possible. And that's what the Chicago Dialogues is all about. Well, thank you all. Thanks a lot. It's all of you. Yeah. Yes. Good night. Good night. Bye.